Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Muslim CEO show. Our vision is Muslims leading the way in solving the world's biggest problems. So this is the perfect place for you if you want to become an amazing leader or grow your business or organization to the next level. We do this by learning from those that have been there, done it and bought the Shawar Kameez. I'm your brother and host Muhammad Rashid and today I'm so excited to have with me the wonderful Ijaz Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum bro. Wa alaikum salam. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Excited to be talking to you today. Good. I'm really excited to have you on the show because like, you have an almost unbelievable story, mashallah. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting into it. But for those that don't know, let me just give you a quick background on Ijaz so that you know a bit about him. So Ijaz Ahmed is a company advisor, a business speaker and a writer for a column in Retail Week. He helps small and medium-sized businesses, but also is experienced as an executive officer, a non-exec and a chairman of FTSE 100 and AIM companies. He's best known for being the founder of FreeServe, which is which was once the UK's largest company. Um, he's also in the Yorkshire Business Power 100. He sits on the advisory board at the University of Huddersfield uh, Business School. And if all that wasn't enough, he's also been awarded a British Empire Medal by the Queen. So there's so much more that we can get into, but inshallah we'll do that in the rest of the show. I want to start with the question that I ask everyone right at the start, uh, which is unscripted, which is, what was 10-year-old Ijaz like? What was 10-year-old Ijaz like? Well, first of all, uh, I, I'm an immigrant to this country. So I was actually born in Pakistan. I was born in Lahore, okay. which is one of the nicest cities in Pakistan. Very cultural, very mm. cosmopolitan, full of Mughal architecture and things like that. So uh, I came to this country when I was three years old. So 10 years old, I was part of a, a number of people that were going to school that, uh, you know, uh, were immigrants uh, and didn't have many things. So uh, the people around me were all living in terraced houses. And most people don't understand that in, in those days, we had to go outside to the toilet. Uh, we didn't have any hot in water. In the UK? Yeah, in the UK, yes. Oh, okay. I, when, when I sometimes give a, a talk, sometimes I tell people that I'm an immigrant to this country and that we had to go outside to the toilet. We had an outside toilet. We didn't have any hot water. And uh, they almost uh, assume that I'm talking about Pakistan. Yeah. But that's what life was like in this country. Wow. Uh, you know, Coronation Street style houses, they all had outside toilets. So we had outside toilets. We had no um, central heating. None of the things that we use to today, none of the things that we take for granted. Uh, so it was actually a pretty poor upbringing. So those are one of the things that motivated me was uh, the fact that it was pretty poor living in a terraced house. And, and that, that was in Huddersfield, yeah? In Huddersfield, which is, for the people that don't know, in between Leeds and Manchester. And Huddersfield was once the centre of the textile industry and uh, all the cloth that uh, were used by people all over the country was made in, in Huddersfield. And it's still known for its cloth and uh, some of the most expensive suits in the world, the cloth still comes from Huddersfield. Wow, okay, wonderful. So, like, when you were 10 years old, what kind of things were you into? Like, what were you like? Yeah, uh, I think compared to my brothers and sisters, uh, I was very motivated to do well in life. And we played outside and played cricket and things like that. But I used to go to the reference library every week. Uh, we came down, I used to read magazines and, wow. uh, about business, uh, about architecture and things like that. So I was always trying to improve myself. But one of the things that motivated me when I was still at school, in secondary school, uh, maybe about 10 years old, I don't know, was an advert that I saw on television. And the advert was for Hovis Bread. And you're probably wondering how Hovis Bread can motivate anyone. <laughs> uh, and in this advert, there was an old guy and he walked out of a mill and he had a clock under his arm and he stood at the gates of the mill and he turned around and looked at the mill for one last time. So he obviously just retired and his retirement present was the clock. And he walked home on the cobble streets and uh, when he got home, uh, he sat in front of the fire and had his harvest bread and the advert finished. Harvest, good today, as it's always been. And when I saw that advert, I thought to myself, oh my God, that man has worked his entire life in that mill and what's he got to show for it? A clock. And I thought about it and I thought every single day, thousands and thousands of people do the same thing. They sit at home after they retired and they think about all the things that they could have done, should have done and would have done. And I was determined then that when I retire, I want to be able to look back at my life 
and say to myself, I've made a difference. Now, making a difference isn't just about making lots of money. Making a difference is being able to look back and say, I've helped other people. I've raised a good family. I've done things that people, uh, you know, can look at me and say, yeah, he's done a great job. Something that I can be proud of. And uh, so that motivated me. And um, I wanted to become a businessman. I wanted to do well in business. So that's one of the things that motivated me. Amazing. Okay, wonderful. So talk us through your journey a little bit. So what did you, did you like study at college? Did you go to uni? Like what, what did you kind of do and what did you focus on? Did you just carry on with the business? Yeah, so uh, I worked hard at school, uh, but unfortunately I failed all my exams at school. I left mm. school with absolutely nothing. The only thing I left school with was a grade one breaststroke in swimming, <laughs> uh, which wasn't very useful for, for anything. So <laughs> I, I couldn't go to college. Uh, so I had to get a job. And it's ironic that I sit on the board of a university now. Yeah. I, give, I give lectures to students to, at universities all over the world. Um, but I left school with absolutely nothing. Uh, so I had to get a job. Um, and... Uh, I was walking past Dixon's, and Dixon's in those days was called Dixon's Photographic. Uh, they were uh, a business that sold cameras, and uh, in the window there was a card that said they were looking for salespeople, and I went home and put my dad's shirt and tie on, and I applied for the job. Uh, job. So my first job was a junior salesman in Dixon's in Huddersfield, and I was earning £30 a week in those days, and that was the end of 1979. So I was working Dixon's, and uh, Dixon's all cameras. And then they started to sell uh, TVs, and they started to sell videos, and then they started to sell home computers, believe it or not, Sinclair ZX80, the Commodore VIC-20, the Amstrad, you know, thing, the BBC computer, things like that. So the business started to grow. Uh, Dixon's bought a, uh, a business called Curry's, and Curry sold what they call white goods, which uh, I don't know whether you're allowed to say now. And white goods <laughs> are things like fridges and washing machines and things like that, which are all white. Uh, and then the business grew. And then my first job uh, in management was as a assistant manager in Bradford, in the Arndale Centre in Bradford. Um, and I did very well there. And then uh, I joined uh, Dixon's as a manager in Halifax, and that was my first manager's job. Um, and then I went to Bury, which is near Manchester. But my life changed in, in Dixon's because they sent me on a course. And on this course, uh, they said that everyone has negative uh, self-beliefs about themselves. And mm -hmm. that's what holds them back. Yeah. And it did all sorts of exercises. And my negative self-beliefs were that I thought that I wasn't good as other people and that I needed to justify myself to other people. And all that happened was I got a card that I put in my pocket, and it said that I, Jairz Ahmed, am as good as everyone else, and I don't need to justify myself to anyone. And after the course, uh, the, uh, there was another vacancy in Manchester Arndale Centre. And uh, Manchester Arndale Centre was the busiest store in the whole of north of England. And I had not been a manager for a year yet. And... Before I went on this course, I probably would have rang around my friends in Dixon's and asked the question, I wonder who's going to get that shop. Right? But I thought to myself, actually, I should apply for it. I'm as mm. good as everyone else, and I can apply for it. I can run that shop. So I applied, and within a year of becoming a manager in Dixon's, I became the manager of the largest store in the north of England. Amazing. Yeah, so, and I think still to this day, most people have negative self-beliefs about themselves and that's what holds them back. And uh, they need to find out what they are and think to themselves, I can do that. And so this, this course that you did, it was something that they did for their managers in terms of developing them? Yes. Wow. And uh, probably they stopped doing it because pe people left. <laughs> yeah. They got so empowered that they would just leave. <laughs> they left and, and they didn't do it anymore. But yeah. it was a great, great course. And you can probably do the same thing now for free by looking on YouTube or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and so you're saying that that one course it kind of transformed your vision of yourself. It free it freed you from like the limitations that you had put on yourself, yeah. and then that basically started everything else for you, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. amazing. It, 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 it's amazing. It's it's just so inspiring that you know a course like that can like change your view on life and your view on yourself. 
and then what becomes possible. So that's wonderful. So so what happened then? You actually went you you went for that job. You became the manager of like one of yeah. the busiest stores in the whole of northern uh, northern Britain. And then then what kind of happened from there? Then what happened? So uh, something else happened that changed my life. Whilst I was a manager of Dixon's Arndale Centre, which was the busiest store, did very well there. Uh, the business turned around. It started to take more money. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed being uh, the manager of the largest store. And then one day uh, we received a memo because there was no email in those days. And the memo uh, said that we have bought a new company called PC World and that the future is going to be selling computers. And we bought this small little company and PC World was just four shops around oh. the M25 in London. And we've bought this business and we're going to expand the business. And as soon as I read this memo, I thought, you know, that's my future. I'm going to be selling computers and I want to work in PC world. And I folded up the memo, I put it in my pocket and I decided then and there that I was going to be a manager in PC world. And luckily for me, the first store north of London was in Leeds, which is only about half an hour away. And I became a manager of PC world in Leeds. Um, And... Uh, that changed my life as well because it was a whole different experience selling PCs. Everyone, it turned out, wanted to buy a computer. Um, And then I bought a computer myself and I'd heard about this thing called the internet. I'd never been on the internet, but I heard about it and I thought, I want to go onto the internet. Uh, So I bought a computer, I bought a modem and I asked the, uh, the staff in my own shop, how do you get onto the internet? And everyone turned around and said, don't know. Nobody could tell me how to get onto the internet, uh, wow. believe it or not. Uh, and then someone in our technical center said to me, you should go on to Demon Internet. They're really good. So I phoned up Demon Internet and I said, I want to go on the internet. What do I need? And the guy said, you need a browser. Uh, I said, OK, how do I get a browser? He said, you can FTP it from our site. Hmm. And I thought to myself, what the hell is an FTP? <laughs> uh, it stands for, by the way, File Transfer Protocol. So you needed to be on the internet to be able to download the browser. Uh, And when I uh, got home, I carried on looking and uh, I found a CD from a magazine cover for an American company called CompuServe. And I joined CompuServe, uh, paid them 20 pounds a month. And when I got onto the internet, I thought, wow, this is fantastic. In the future, everyone is gonna want to get onto the internet. And I started to think about my, my experience and I thought every day people ask us, how do you get on the internet? And we turn around and we say, we don't know. And if we become an internet service provider, an ISP, we can get to the customer first because they're stood in front of us. So we should become an ISP and then we can also control the first thing the customer sees uh, when they get on the internet, which is the homepage. And we, we can sell advertising, do all sorts of things. So with that great idea, I thought I went to see the managing director of PC World and told him about my great idea. Uh, what do you think he said? Uh, <laughs> it's a great idea. <laughs> no, he said no. Not interested. Uh, and he said no. Uh, he said no to my idea. Uh, mm. So I went back to uh, PC World and carried on um, doing my business. And another thing that most of another thing that changed my perception was um, something that I read in Vanity Fair, which is an American magazine. And in Vanity Fair, they had an article about the new establishment. They said the old establishment were the oil barons, barons, the steel magnets, people like that. And the new establishment are the people that control and own uh, media and content. And they managed to get together people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and a guy called Ted Turner. Now, Ted Turner was the guy who started the world's first 24-hour news channel, Mm. uh, CNN. CNN, And uh, there was a guy talking about him, and what he said was, what people like Ted are required to do is do the obvious before it becomes obvious to everyone else, because by the time it becomes obvious to everyone else, it's too late because people like Ted have done it and the other guys haven't. I mean, what possible reason did Ted have to start a 24-hour news channel? And if you think about it, people probably thought, what a stupid idea. Who's going to watch news 24 hours a day? But really, the idea was it was about watching news when you want to watch it. Something happens in the world, the first thing you do is go on to 24-hour news. And it was a great idea. And when I read that article, I thought, yeah, just because this guy said no doesn't mean to say it's a bad idea. He just didn't, couldn't see it. it. And all I'm doing is doing the obvious 
before it becomes obvious to everyone else. So I persevered and I managed to see uh, the group CEO of Dixon's and I told him about my idea. And he said, you know, I've got no idea if it's going to work or not, but let's give it a go because we have to do something on the Internet. So on the 22nd of September 1998, we launched FreeServe to an unsuspecting public. And within hours, people walk into our shops, picking up CDs. Every time we saw the computer, we said, you need internet access, don't you? <laughs> Here you go. And um, by uh, December, three years after we launched, we were the largest internet company in the UK. Uh, we were actually bigger than CompuServe and A America Online AOL. And people were walking up and down uh, the country, picking up. Uh, free serve CDs and for the people that remember that's a free serve CD <laughs> uh, and uh, the reason why this was so important was it had the browser on there Windows did not include include a browser and the reason it didn't include a browser was there was no point because there's hardly anybody in the UK or in America on the internet so there's no point including it so you needed to have a browser so you didn't need to FTP it got the CD put it into the computer and uh, installed everything and away we went and we did very very well now people ask me often is how did he make money if you're giving it away how did he make any money well we made a fortune actually uh, because when British Telecom got privatized uh, the rule was that when a, a call starts on one network and terminates on another BT have to share that revenue which was a fraction okay. of a penny hmm. fraction of a penny but when you're turning over, um, doing, doing more than a billion minutes a month, uh, a fraction of a penny adds up, doesn't it? And the best bit is we didn't collect the money. They collected it and just gave us our share. <laughs> uh, so wow. we got money each month. And uh, the technology, we outsourced that to another company, so we didn't have to own the technology. And when people got onto our homepage, uh, we had things like shopping channels on there. And people were paying us to go on there. We had a search engine on there. We were making two and a half million pounds a year just from our share of the search. Uh, so the, it worked very, very well. Uh, so the business grew. And nine months after we actually launched the business, Dixon decided they were going to separate the business and they were going to float it on the stock exchange. Mm. So nine months after we launched, we floated in, in London and in, in New York on the NASDAQ. Um, for a valuation of 1.5 billion pounds. Oof, that's B, billion, right? Billion, yes. <laughs> wow. So, you know, a, a year earlier, I was a manager of a Dixon store, and now I, I was an executive officer of a company that was worth one and a half billion pounds. Wow. But it gets better because the, uh, the share price kept on going up. We'd started the dot-com boom in this country, hmm. and at one point, we were actually worth nine billion pounds. Uh, we were worth more than our parent company, Dixon's. Uh, and then the market started to go down uh, and we had a bit of a crash. Uh, we ended up selling the business three years after we launched to France Telecom for £1.6 billion. So this is a company Amazing. that was only three years old. And at that point, uh, once I was able to sell my shares, I sold my shares and I left Dixon's. And I haven't actually left FreeServe. And I haven't actually worked full time since 2001 mm -hmm. um, because the, the shares that I got uh, was more than enough so that I could do what I wanted to do. Uh, so that's the story of uh, myself in Dixon's and how FreeServe started. This is this is mind blowing stuff. Seriously, like it's really mind blowing, and and it's even more mind blowing for me knowing that like, you're like me, like a Pakistani who was born in Pakistan, yeah. and you know this is what you like achieved. So. I think it's amazing. Now, there's a couple of points that I want to pick up yeah. on in each of the story, right? So the mm. first one, and I think this will help a lot of people, okay, is that, you know, you're like a Pakistani guy in the north of England, and you come up with with this idea, which you think is a really good idea, right? So mm. you haven't spoke to anyone about it, no one else knows, but you think it's a good idea, right? How mm. do you pluck up the courage to go to management, for example, someone who's above you, and say, mm. look, I've got this idea, especially where... You know, we're talking like this is like 20 years ago, maybe more, right? Yeah, so yeah. how, how, do, you, how do you do that with an idea like that? Yeah, I think, the, I mean, I've had lots of people come up to me and say, you know, I had that idea as well. Yeah, But the thing is, you didn't do anything about it, did you? Exactly, yeah. Uh, and if you've got a good idea, you've got to do something about it. And I think if you go back to that course that I was sent on, you know, I'm as good as everyone else. 
I don't have to justify myself. So uh, people like me can also come up with good ideas, but you've also had have to have the courage to do something about it. Now, not every idea is a good idea, you know, and uh, I call it garlic bread syndrome, okay. which is based on Peter Kay's favorite garlic bread joke. You know, boss, I've seen the future. It's garlic bread. And, um, you know, his boss says, well, I've heard you right. Garlic bread, bread with garlic on it. No, I don't think so. I'm not having that. Uh, so people will say yeah. no to good ideas. And we're all eating garlic bread now. It, it was an obvious idea, wasn't it? You know, yeah. really garlic bread. Uh, but can you imagine 50, 60 years thinking about having eating bread, bread with yeah. garlic on it? What a stupid idea. Yeah. So it was the same with free serve, you know, what a stupid idea. But it's actually quite an obvious idea. Uh, but then uh, you've got something called um, ugly baby syndrome. Now, ugly baby syndrome is the opposite of garlic bread because not every idea is going to be a good idea. And most of the people that come to see me with ideas are actually poor ideas. And ugly baby syndrome is uh, you've got a couple and they've just you know had a baby and they're in love with their baby because it's their baby. Yeah. And you go along and you look at the baby and you think, shit, that's an ugly looking baby, isn't it? <laughs> now, what do you do? Do you say, ah, oh, that's really nice? Or do you mm -hmm. say, you know, that's an ugly baby? Well, in business, uh, you've got to say, that's an ugly baby. It's not going to work. So if you've got a great idea, pluck up the courage to talk about it. But unfortunately, not every idea is going to be a good idea. So how, how do you validate that? Because you're how right. How do you like, validate it? Yeah. yeah. How do you yeah. validate that? Yeah, good question. Now, one of my favorite people is Simon Cowell. Mm, okay, right? yeah, me too. <laughs> because, yeah, the X Factor is fantastic. You get all these people who can't sing. And uh, in the back, you've got the t-shirts. They've got the parents with the t-shirts on, the friends. You know, they're praying for this person to get through to the next round. And Simon Cowell would just say, no, you can't sing. And that's what an expert can't. does. Like, he can just see yeah, it. Yeah, he just yeah. say it. Now, the, the mistake they've made is, They've only asked people who have got a vested interest. They've asked the parents, they've asked the friends, and of course they're going to say, "Yeah, yeah, fantastic singer." Mm. They're not going to tell you you can't sing. So you've got to find people who haven't got vested interest. Uh, find people who can listen to your idea, and the chances are, if it's not a very good idea, they'll tell you it's not a good idea. Uh, so you, you, that's what you've got to do. If you ask your parents or your friends, they're going to say, "That's a great idea, that is," mm. but no. Okay, uh, so actually. but then but then you kind of did that, isn't it? Where you thought you had a good idea, you mm. went, you actually got the courage to do something about it. You went to the manager, and then yeah. the manager was like, "No, leave no. it." Well, so yeah. so at that yeah. point, like most people would have gone, you know what? I tested it, I tried it. He said it's not good. Just leave mm. it and and be done with it. You know. So yeah, why why go back? Why do it again? Yeah. Well, there's another thing called confirmation bias, and confirmation bias is that if you've got a bias then you come up with all sorts of reasons to confirm your bias. So this guy, the managing director of PC World, had probably got a bias, which is uh, how can someone like him who's an educator, no degree, come up with a great idea? So he'll come up with all sorts of reasons why it's not going to work. Uh, and that's what happens. But, you you know, so the Vanity Fair article, which is got to do the obvious before it becomes obvious to everyone else, comes into play. So you've got to then persevere and do something about it because just because someone says no doesn't mean to say it's not a good idea. Okay, amazing. So so then let, let's talk a little bit about like, you know, when, when you did go back and what was that journey like? Because you were kind of like, you know, obviously you're important that you're a store manager and especially with PC World because in my head, like now I can't imagine there was four stores of PC World, right? It's crazy yeah. to even think about that. And yeah. now like it's Curry's PC World, right? So yeah. like, tell me what it was like to, it was kind of like an embarking on an adventure where you're like a store manager. So you're doing the store thing every day. And then suddenly yeah. like you've got this idea now and you've got the size of Dixon's behind you. And now you guys yeah. are going like, okay, we're going to do something with this. I mean, what was that like? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I mean, talking to this group CEO, uh, looking back at, back at it, I wasn't scared. I, I must have the courage to do it. I wasn't particularly scared. Uh, you know, I went there, told him about my idea, had a PowerPoint presentation. I must have been persuasive. Um, and for him to say, yeah, uh, okay, let's do it. Um, one of the things I think of sometimes is, 
how did I change from becoming you know a store manager to someone who all of a sudden was staying in five star hotels buying first class talking to people that uh, were big business people uh, how did I, I do that and I think it goes back to you know uh, my ambition when I was younger uh, so uh, I found it quite easy now one of the things that people do is they don't read the right things uh, they don't read about other people you know my uh, colleagues were reading the daily mirror uh, or the sun and i was reading the times i would read forbes i would read fortune so fortune magazine i was read vanity fair so when i got to uh, that level in my life i fitted in quite easy uh, because i'd read about it i'd read about successful people things like that and i think a lot of people don't take the time to learn about things so but one of the a, a piece of advice that I give to people is that uh, most people think their most important asset is their house or their car. So they spend money on that when they don't realize the most invaluable asset is themselves. So you've got to invest in yourselves. And it's even easier now to invest in yourselves because of the power of the Internet. You can go onto YouTube. You can watch all sorts of lectures from people. Uh, you've got to read the right things. Um, and that if you, if you want to get in life, then that's what you should do. You should invest in yourselves. If it means buying a book, buy the book. If it means paying for a video, pay for the video. Uh, uh, and don't do things like spend money on your house when you should spend money on yourself. Mm, okay, wonderful. I mean, one, one of the things you said there that you think that a lot of is to do with the ambition that you had, right? Yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting because uh, I have to, we have different students that I've taught. And yeah. I met up with one of the students yesterday and I said, how are the other students doing? And he said, they're good, but they're not really, they graduated, but they're not really that passionate about getting a job. They don't have that yeah. hunger. They don't have that drive. They don't have that ambition. Mm. So what, what advice would you give to someone like that? Especially like some of the people who are in their early 20s, maybe that they're kind of doing things, but they don't have that hunger, that passion, that drive, that ambition, but they want it. They want it, but they're just not sure how to get themselves like that. What would you say? Yeah, uh, I, you know, it, I see when I go on the train, I see somebody pushing the trolley saying, uh, you know, tea, coffee, sandwiches. And they never expected to be doing that when they were at school. Uh, but they made sorts of, all sorts of mistakes. Now, once I was actually asked to talk at a graduation uh, ceremony at a college, and uh, the mistake they made was they never actually asked me what I was going to say. Uh, so when I got on the stage, there's, uh, there's a room full of kids with their caps and gowns on. they are just graduated uh, and they were looking forward to their lives going forward, you know, their life going forward. And I said to them that, you know, congratulations on graduating today. And but do you want to know what the future is going to hold for you? I said the chances are in 20 years time, most of you are going to be in a shit job. And when the alarm goes off in the morning, you're going to keep on pressing the snooze button because you don't want to get up. You don't want to go to work. And when you get on the train or the bus uh, and look at all the people on there, they're also going to be miserable. They don't want to go to work. When you get to work, uh, you're going to hate your boss. And uh, When you get home, you're going to go on to right moves or something like that and look at all the houses on there and dream about being able to afford the deposit for a house that's what you've got to look forward to and you can imagine the look of horror on all these yeah. kids faces and i said you know but it doesn't have to be that way i said i can tell you a few things that you need to do and uh, in 20 years time you can look back and say i'm glad i listened to that guy or you can look back and say i wish i'd listened to that guy and uh, and that's really what it's about don't you can't assume just because you've graduated that you're going to have a great job. You can't assume that you're going to get a great job and earn lots of money. It's not going to happen that way. You've got to invest in yourself and you've got to work hard. Now, when uh, you go for an interview for a job, uh, the person interviewing you, the chances are all the other 50 people that have applied, they've got the same qualifications. You're no different from all the other people that have applied. The reason why you might get that job is because you've got personality, you've got people skills, you come across and talk in a different way to all the other people. 
that's the thing that's going to make a difference. So don't assume that, you know, just because you've graduated, you're going to end up in a good job because that's not going to happen. So going back to what I said before, you've got to invest in yourself. So don't make that mistake. Okay, so when it comes to like actually developing themselves, because you're saying this is a big thing about it, like how do you decide what do I focus on? Because you know, one of the problems with YouTube and the internet is that there's so much there, right? So yeah. I'm like, okay, good. Like I get it. I need to be better. Otherwise I'm going to be in trouble in 20 years. Mm -hmm. How do I get better? What do I listen to? What do I focus? What do I do? Yeah. Well, the, 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 one of the great things on the internet uh, is reviews. So if you want to buy a book, read about what other people say about it. If you want to watch a video, read about what other people say about it. But also subscribe to uh, newsletters. You know, I still to this day subscribe to newsletters and I, I learn new things every single day. Um, I, I find it difficult reading a book, very difficult to read a book because it's quite long. Uh, so I'll subscribe to newsletters. And, you know, one of the ones that I subscribe to is uh, um, called Medium, medium.com. And I read about all sorts of interesting things. So I don't read books, but I probably read more than a book a week if you add them all up. Uh, so I think that's what you've got to do. And it's up to you what you want to learn about. But take time to learn about things. You know, I often wonder when I watch people on their phone, what they're actually doing. The chances are they're doing all sorts of things that are not going to help them in life. They're playing games, they're talking to people. I do very little on social media, uh, very little. You know, you can have a look at my Twitter account. There's very little on there. You can look at uh, my LinkedIn account and you'll find that I've written blogs uh, about all sorts of things. Uh, you know, things that I've written about in Retail Week or other ideas that I've had. I've written about things like um, why there's very few black or Asian people on the boards of companies, you know, and uh, there's been, been a reaction and people left comments and things like that. But what I don't do is mess around on social media, talking to people, sharing all sorts of stupid videos and things like that. So, you know, learn to spend time on things that are going to benefit you. And if you see something and you're not quite sure if it's any good or not, read the reviews because that'll tell you. Amazing. Okay, that's really good. That's actually how I, I look at books as well. Like mm. Reviews are a big thing. Um, so what I want you to do is just delve into a little bit, like uh, what are some of the big lessons that you learn uh, about entrepreneurship because you went from being an employee to effectively being like a massive entrepreneur and like you were kind of like running a company like the size of Instagram or Facebook or one of these yeah, things right yeah, so yeah. what's the kind of lessons that you learned about playing at that level about entrepreneurship about people and management and everything yeah well there's there's all sorts of of lessons uh one of the the most obvious one is no one cares about you right? might sound simple uh, but when you're in business no one gives a damn about you um, and an example of that is that during this uh, lockdown period there's been lots of people that have been made redundant and um, you might have thought they, they love you as an employee but there you go you've gone now thank you very much uh, so don't assume that people think that you're invaluable because you're not uh, if uh, if you leave, uh, they're not going to send you a Christmas card or anything like that. You're just going to go. So, you know, uh, think about that very carefully. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of look at something to remind me at, about things. Uh, so when I give a talk, uh, these are some of the things that I talk about. Uh, follow your gut. Lot, everyone's got a gut feeling. Follow it sometimes. Um, and um, the other one is pivot. Pivot means change direction. Uh, if you've been in uh, a particular job or something like that for 20 years, then think about changing. Uh, don't keep on doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, another one is learn psychology. Uh, people don't seem to learn about psychology. Psychology is what makes the world go around. Now, I'm a retailer, um, and all my life, all I've ever done is is actually used retail principles in business. So I work for, um, I'm helping a law firm at the moment, don't know anything about law. Uh, I'm the chairman of a company that builds large websites. I can't build a website. 
I'm working with another company that does gym wear. Uh, I don't wear gym wear. You know, it doesn't matter. Apply retail principles to everything. So walk around shops, uh, supermarkets, and things like that, and observe how they do things, and apply that to your own business. Don't walk around blind. Uh, you know, uh, um, look at things in a very careful way. Now, one of the the things that leads on to is what is the difference between an entrepreneur and a business person? Uh, because I meet people that claim they are uh, serial on- entrepreneurs, or well, the only cereal they've had is the breakfast that they had in the morning. Uh, so what is the difference between an entrepreneur and a business person? Well, there's three main differences. The first is that an entrepreneur has got a greater power of empathy than a business person. Uh, they can actually uh, feel what the customer feels. So you might be surprised to learn that people like uh, Apple and Nike and Ikea don't do any market research, right? They pretend to be the customer. Um, And if you pretend to be the customer, you've got more chances of being successful than uh, um, a business person. Uh, A business person uh, doesn't have the same empathy. Uh, An entrepreneur has got a greater eye for detail uh, and observations. They see things that other people don't see. And then the last thing is that business people need to see it before they believe it, whereas an entrepreneur can imagine it before it happens. So free serve, you know, uh, this guy just couldn't imagine it. So he said no. Uh, and then once free serve was launched, everyone said, you know, that was a great. I knew that was going to work. That was a great idea. That. And another example of that is um, Steve Jobs. Uh, Apple retail stores uh, have got the highest turnover per square foot than any uh, retail business in the world. Now, when Steve Jobs came up with the idea of opening shops, he went to his board and he said, look, we don't control the last piece of the jigsaw, so we should actually open shops. Uh, And they said no. Uh, So what he did was, Steve Jobs being Steve Jobs, he actually built a shop in a warehouse. Uh, When he had it all ready, he took his board to the warehouse and he showed them the shop. And once they saw it, they said, yeah, actually, this is a great idea. Let's do it. Whereas before, they couldn't imagine it. Yeah. So entrepreneurs can imagine it before it actually happens. So you've got to learn to do that way. Um, uh, don't listen to customers, which might sound a bit stupid. Um, but don't listen to them. You know, And this goes back to uh, become the customer. Right, so don't listen to. Uh, it's Henry a bit Ford. like Henry Ford, isn't it? He said, yeah, if I had absolutely. asked them what yeah. they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Absolutely, faster mm. horse and cart. And Kodak, uh, they actually invented the digital camera, mm. but they made the mistake of asking customers what they wanted, and uh, they said, what "Better quality film." So someone else took over, and they, uh, you know, took over and made the digital camera but they should have done it uh, as well. So, you know, it's having that empathy. Don't listen to what customers want. Um, You only have seconds to make an impact. Uh, The chances are when you watched me on the video, you'd already made your mind up about me uh, seconds in. Hopefully by now you've changed your impression of me uh, because I've, I've spoken and hopefully I've talked some sense. But when you meet people, you only have seconds to make an impact. So, you know, think about how you talk, think about how you dress and things like that. Um, and uh, so those are just some of the, uh, the things that I would suggest that people think about. Uh, and that's the things that will make a difference for them. Wonderful, wonderful. I really like uh, each and every one of those. And uh, what I relate a lot of the things you're saying back to is actually one big principle, right? And yeah. I want to get your advice on this because I think yeah. it's a really important Go one, it. which is all of these things are great that you said, but mm. at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the individual to make decisions and choices, mm. right? So what advice do you give to people about making decisions and choices? Like, for example, like, I imagine something, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm having empathy, I'm thinking the customers might like this, but they might like that. And, and all these decisions that I've got to make, mm. like, how do I make these decisions? Well, I don't think there's a simple answer, but think about the, the guy uh, in the Hovis Bread advert who, uh, you know, sits down and starts thinking about all the things that he should have done. 
So people find reasons why they shouldn't do things. Um, I've got a mortgage, I've got bills to pay, I've got kids, things like that. And uh, if you actually um, do that, then when you retire, you'll sit back and think about all the things you should have done. It's too late then. It's far too late. Uh, you don't have to take risks. You know, you might be able to find ways of doing things so that uh, your pension, your uh, mortgage isn't at risk. Uh, but you've got to then go around and look at grants that are available from government schemes, um, loans that are hardly, you know, um, very low interest, things like that. But don't make the mistake of not doing it. Mm, okay. That, that, oh, by the way, one of the ideas is yeah. nick ideas. Right. Believe it or not, you can nick ideas. Now, nicking ideas isn't just about, um, um, you know, what people like in China get accused of, which is nicking the technology and things like that. Uh, but nicking the ideas, you see something and that inspires you. Now, uh, one example of that is is this. Right? This is um, a brawn calculator. Right? Okay. And Apple nicked that, believe it or not. Uh, if you look at uh, an Apple phone, mm. can you see? Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, it's uh, exactly the same. Uh, the rounded corners and things like that. There, and there's no secret, Apple will admit uh, that they were inspired by the brawn calculator to nick ideas. Wow. Uh, if you look at my logo on my website, uh, I got the idea from FedEx. You'll notice it's the same style as FedEx. Mm. Uh, so if you see someone else do something and you like it, there's nothing wrong with being inspired by it and copying it. Uh, I'm not saying you should steal patents or anything like that or trademarks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you see something and you know, just nick the idea. It's it's like uh, Pablo Picasso. He said that great art, a good artist copy, great artist steal. So yeah, that, that's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. If you see a color that you like somewhere, just uh, take it. Yeah, okay. things like that. Amazing. So one thing I wanted to ask you, actually, especially for I guess people who are who are kind of like a bit younger, they mm. might not understand uh, the whole uh, financial model of free serve. Right? Yeah. Like, so you kind of talked about how it became a billion dollar company and the fact that, you know, you were, you were actually very good timing. Like if you had started after the dot com bubble, it would have been very different. Right. Um, you know, to, to actually get that model going, obviously you had lots of stores, uh, PCs were flying off like hotcakes and you were giving the CDs away. But fundamentally, like you were making money because at that time, um, mm. Internet was charged per minute. That's right. Right. Yeah. Local so, rate phone call. Yeah. Okay, so so what would happen? That I would take the I would take the CD. I would go into the house. I'd load it up, and then mm. I would start using your number to dial the internet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then a local rate phone number. And so every minute that I was spending, and and before that, I'm not I'm not sure if it, if it was correct or not, but before that they used to charge per minute for mm. being on the internet. Like your, your service provider would say, right, you're going to be on the internet for 10 minutes. We're going to charge you 10 minutes plus you'll pay for the phone call. Is that right? No. So it was, um, you basically, uh, you paid a monthly amount, a mm -hmm. subscription, and then you paid a local rate phone call. Okay. So on and, a weekend, and, it was and a And what you guys minute. did, and I think, and this is what I'm saying, my, my own experience was like, um, you know, I went into a store, I heard of free serve, I got the CD. I remember getting it, right, and trying it. And I was like, yeah. wow, like, this is completely free. And, you know, in, in nowadays, there's a lot yeah. of Trello and there's uh, yeah. all these kind of softwares which are free. But in those days, people didn't give away free stuff no, like this. No, that's right, yeah. So it kind of blew my mind a little bit. I'm like, hold on. Yeah. So every internet provider out there wants a monthly charge from me. And yeah. these guys are giving me a CD for free and I can get yeah. on the internet right now. I'm like, yeah. how are they doing this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, there's a couple of things there that are important. First one is that... Um, being a shop manager, I could see uh, the model. And the model was that we don't know anything about technology, so we find a technology company and we outsource it to them. Uh, we don't need to spend any money on marketing. So a CompuServe the CD that I got, they had to pay a fortune to put their CD on the magazine cover. So we didn't have to pay anything for marketing because we had a 1,000 shops up and down the country and they People can walk in and pick up a CD, so we've got no money uh, you know, expenses there. 
Um, and uh, so we had very little cost. Now, when we became the largest internet company in the country, what people didn't understand is that we only had three people. We only employed three people, believe it or not, uh, because the model works so beautifully. But one of the questions people ask me is, well, why didn't you do it yourself? You know, why did you go to Dixon's? And uh, this is uh, a very, very good question. And this is the reason why a lot of people are not successful. And that is that the reason why people aren't successful is they come up with a great idea. But what they haven't figured out how is how they're going to get the customer. The cost of acquiring the customer. And the reason why FreeServe was so successful, because we were not the first free ISP, believe it or not. The reason why uh, people remember FreeServe and not the other two is because we had a route to market. And the route to market was the shops. So if you said to your friend, you know, you should try a free serve. And, uh, and the friend says, what, how do I get that? You say, going to Dixon's Curry's PC World. And uh, you can pick up the CD. So the cost of acquiring that customer was nothing. Uh, I met the, the founder of Plusnet, which was bought by BT. And they still advertise on the television based, based in Sheffield. They did the exact opposite of us. They wrote, wrote their own code. They bought their own servers. Uh, they advertised on the television, things like that. And it meant that they uh, actually made a lot less money. And it was far more difficult for them to acquire customers, whereas we acquired the customer for nothing. So lots of people come up with some great ideas and they forget that they need to get the customer. And the cost of acquiring that customer sometimes is more than the profit they're likely to make from that customer. So if you've got a great idea, uh, sit down and think about how you're going to get that customer. And so this this is actually a really good point, I think, because it, it's it's now showing, because on the surface, you look at 3.7, you think, great idea, that's why it was successful. But mm. you're right, like once you start getting deeper into this, you start to realize that there was other components, like, you know, we talk yeah. about timing, but also, like like you said, if you have something like FreeServe and then you've got a network of, you know, so many stores, right? Mm. Uh, mm. And, and obviously it's a big brand store as well. Uh, yeah. So distribution is easy. Then on top of that, there's no cost for you to actually distribute. Then you've mm. got salespeople who are actually trained salespeople selling in store for you anyway. And yeah. then when they're buying that thing, you're saying, here's a free add on. Um, mm. and, and then also you're playing the whole middleman game because you're saying yeah. that you're not setting up all the internet work and stuff. You're just kind of outsourcing that side. You're, yeah. you're kind of using your existing infrastructure and network to sell. Yeah. And yeah. you're just sitting there with three people with a billion billion pound company. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, for instance, you've got the same problem. Up until you contacted me, I'd never heard of your organization. Yeah. Now, you want to be a larger organization. Uh, so how do you become a larger organization? Uh, that's the problem. And uh, the biggest problem biggest factor is no one knows you. Uh, you, could, you could pay money on Google AdWords, uh, but that'd cost you money. So you need to find ways of promoting yourself. Um, and the easiest way of promoting yourself is uh, get other people to promote you on their website and things like that. Uh, so you've got the same problem as everyone else has as well. Uh, some people are very lucky, uh, they, they go viral and there's no magic formula on how you become viral. Uh, if, it, if it was a magic formula, everyone would do it, you know. Uh, so the problems that existed then still exist today. The, nothing's changed. Mm. So how you acquire the customer is the hardest part of any uh, internet business or any business, in fact. Because if you open a shop on the high street, then you've still got to acquire that customer, paid rent and rates and staff costs and things like that. So uh, people should think about that very, very carefully if they want to set up in business. Mm. And so, so while while like the models working and all this kind of stuff, were you were you still doing your normal job in the store, or were you having no. to like go and do other things, or how was it working on a day to day yeah. thing before, while so, you were doing stuff? Uh, the day uh, the day it launched. Um, I was, um, I'd left a few weeks before, uh, or a few months before, setting up FreeSurf, um, doing deals with people uh, to go onto our, home, you know, onto our website and things like that. Uh, so my job became uh, business development director. So my job was, people were, you know, this is the other great thing as well. We didn't have to go out there to, to do deals. 
people came to us. Yeah. Every single day, people were knocking on the door, uh, sending emails, things like that. You know, I'd like to do business with FreeSurf. You know, I want to be on your shopping channel. I'd like to to do this and I'd like to do that. Uh, the biggest problem that I had was deciding which people to do business with. Uh, the biggest problem was figuring out how much I, sh I should ask them for and things like that. So it was a great, great business model. People were coming to us. So my job was doing the deals uh, on the website. It was great. It was absolutely fantastic. And mm -hmm. my life changed completely. You know, uh, it had gone from, uh, as I said, working in a shop to uh, I used to go to London every single week from from uh, Leeds on the train. Uh, but now I'd go first class. Uh, I would uh, travel all over the world. Uh, and again, I would travel first class. And when I got there, I'd stay in five star hotels. Uh, people were desperate to go out for dinner with me because they wanted to sell their proposition. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we'd go to fancy restaurants, some of them Michelin star restaurants. Uh, my life changed in in so many ways. Uh, for instance, things like I'd got uh, since FreeSev, I've got to meet so many famous people. Uh, you know, I've met the president of the United States, uh, not Donald Trump, by the way. Uh, I've met George Bush. You know, great guy, uh, George Bush Senior. Um, I've met uh, lots of famous politicians. I've met the Queen uh, a number of times. I've met uh, Prince Charles a number of times. Prince Andrew a number of times. Uh, I've met um, CEOs of uh, enormous corporations. I've met, um, you know, people in uh, entertainment. Um, I've met all sorts of people. And, you know, once uh, I went for dinner uh, in a fancy restaurant in London and I looked back and Steven Spielberg was sat there mm, wow. uh, right behind me. Uh, and then uh, Mick Jagger walks in saying, I'm sorry, I'm late. <laughs> uh, and then another guy walks in and said the same thing. I'm sorry, I'm late. And he's got a bandana. Uh, on and a beard and I, thought, I wonder who that guy is and it was Tom Hanks Wow! Uh, and he was filming Castaway which is why he had that on mm. and they were sat behind me I was listening to them <laughs> and I, I can tell you uh, you know I've met all these famous people and they're all normal people and they were just talking about normal things like you and I would talk about you know there was nothing special about them and the only person that was different is the Queen she's okay. got an aura about her you know you wouldn't dare say anything before she asks you a question. <laughs> uh, but everyone else I've met, they're just normal, everyday people. <laughs> Nothing yeah. special about them at all. You can talk about all sorts of things that, that you know, we talk about. Amazing. And so, what, what, you know, with all these kind of uh, changes that happen in your life, yeah. um, how did you, like, you, you kind of mentioned already that you, you did fine at that level because you were already thinking on that level, you were already mm. reading on that level and you were kind of doing that. Um, but when it got to that stage when, you know, the company's actually floated and, like, now it's worth, like, a billion, like, mm. what did that feel like and what was going through your mind at that stage and, and what were you kind of hoping would happen mm. from there? How did it feel? It felt fantastic. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with admitting that money makes a difference. Mm. Nothing wrong at all. It, it, it can help you in so many ways, you know, um, paying your, your mortgage off and things like that. It's a fantastic feeling. So there's nothing wrong with admitting that money is actually good. For, you know, you can have a great time. But the one thing I was always um, conscious of was not to become a, a different person. Uh, so I, I still live in the same house that I did before. And my brother lives uh, just on the street behind me, and my sister lives down the road. Uh, I live in Huddersfield in an area which is predominantly full of Pakistani people. Uh, there's five mosques within a mile of where I live. I, I can get four naan for a pound just down the road. <laughs> um, you know, um, so what I, I didn't want to do, and I, hopefully I haven't done, is become a narcissist. Mm. Uh, you know, if you don't know what it is, you should look that word up, and these are people that pretend to be something that they're not. Uh, they like to show off. They like to f drive fast cars and big cars and things like that. You know, so I think it's very important to become, uh, so not become, not change as a person. And I get to uh, go to schools and give talks to uh, children. And that's the reason why I got my 
British Empire medal it was for services to uh, you know going into schools and talking to young children to try and motivate them and one of the questions that I always get asked by kids because they're predominantly um, you know ethnic minority schools is what car do you drive because <laughs> their idea of success yeah. is is the car that you drive Mm. Uh, and that's wrong, isn't it? You know, uh, is forget about uh, all the things that you've done, it's, and that's because you, you know it might be a drug dealer that's driving a fancy car. Yeah. So that's what they want to do, and it shouldn't be about that. Uh, and uh, the truth is, and I never tell them why. I haven't got a car. No, believe it or not, I haven't got a car. And the reason I haven't got a car is because I've got epilepsy and I can't drive a car. I could have a seizure at any moment. Mm. But I don't tell them that I've got epilepsy. I just say, I haven't got a car. And what do you mean you haven't got a car? <laughs> How did you get here today? Uh, and sometimes I take my train to get out and say, look, I came on the train. Um, and they find it difficult to understand. Uh, but so driving... Uh, a, a fancy car isn't the ideal way of showing how successful you are. But a lot of people, unfortunately, do. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we've right. all seen it, haven't we? I think it's wonderful that um, you've preserved who you are, but you've grown so much. You know, mm. I think it's really wonderful that you know, you've know kind of done that. Um, tell me a little bit about like the, kind of the close of uh, FreeServe for you in the sense of like when it, when it got sold and stuff. Like, how did you feel when it was sold and, and how did that come about and why did it happen? Mm. The reason it got sold was because uh, the, uh, the actual dot-com crash happened. So we were worth less than before. So it's a good time to actually cash out and take the money. Uh, and so that's what happened. And we almost uh, got sold for £6 billion. Wow. Um, and that deal, unfortunately, fell through. So we, we didn't do it. Uh, so, But we did okay at selling it for £1.6 yeah. billion. Uh, you know, three years old. Uh, so, um, and uh, before that, I wasn't able to sell my shares. I was uh, what they call locked in. And so all I could do is look at how much I was worth. Uh, I couldn't actually sell them. Uh, so once we sold the business, I was able to then sell my shares. So I then sold my shares and I was able to pursue other things in life, you know. So, so, hold on. so you're saying that, so you actually had shares in, in they gave you shares in free service as well when you yeah. set it up. Yeah. Ah, because like you said, there's some newspaper stories and stuff which were like, you know, you yeah. had you were just paid your normal yeah, like, yeah. PC they're, World they're, salary. But that's yeah. not true. You were given shares in the actual yeah, yeah. company. Yeah, I mean, there's one, you know, think, thinking about Donald Trump, you know, fake news. Yeah. Uh, there was one famous story i was uh, voted number one in the hall of fame uh, in a, a business age magazine for what i did and uh, uh, th they interviewed me and it's quite a long interview and the guy said you know how much do you get paid and i said i don't really want to talk about it but for some stupid reason i said oh, you gotta remember twenty thousand pounds goes a long way in leads uh, and he printed that <laughs> you know yeah. and then someone in the daily mirror saw that and they thought, you know, yeah, I can't be right. So they phoned up Dixon's and they say, you know, uh, is this right you get paid £20,000 a year? And instead of saying, don't be stupid, uh, they said, no comment. So they took that as meaning that, so they only paid £20,000. Mm. And um, I was going down to London uh, on the train and when I got to King's Cross, the phone rang. And someone from Dixon's saying, have you seen the Daily Mirror today? I said, no. Can you buy it and call us back? <laughs> and I opened the Daily Mirror, and there's a picture of me smiling. And the headline is, this man made £2.9 billion from Dixon's. And what do they pay him? £20,000 a year. <laughs> and no, we don't know why he's smiling either. Uh, um, so it was, and, then, and then the week after, I had media training from the BBC on how to handle journalists, you know. Uh, but uh, so I've learned an important lesson there. Don't joke with journalists, you know. But no, I was getting paid a very good salary and I had shares Amazing. in the business, which I was able to sell once we sold the business. Yeah. This, and I this haven't is... worked full time since then. Wow. Not sure. Amazing. I mean, th this is one of those things where, you know, you meet someone and they tell you, that, like, you must meet people and, like, you talk to them and tell them the story. And it just it's just unbelievable, isn't it? That this, mm. this guy is, like, the guy that did this, not sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, uh, it is. Uh, um, I mean... Um, 
I thought by now uh, people would have forgotten about free research. It's 20 years ago, you know, just over 20 years ago. Um, it was since we set it up, but it's not 20 years yet since we sold it. That'll be next year. Um, and I thought people would have forgotten about FreeServe, but FreeServe left such an important uh, impression on people's lives because for an awful lot of people, it was their first experience of the yes, internet. You've got to remember exactly. there was no internet. So the first time they'd been onto the internet, the first time they'd sent an email, the first time they'd looked at a website, the first time mm. they did a search. And then I meet younger people, and, uh, and even those people, they'll say things like, my dad was on the uh, on on free serve. My, my parents were on free serve. Yeah. So even younger people, they've heard of free serve, and I don't think people sometimes understand the the impression uh, that it left. Uh, and the other thing it did was it started the dot com boom, because before free serve, there was very few people on the internet, so mm -hmm. there was no one to sell something to. You know, then all of a sudden there was two million people on the internet. Uh, so people could start to open e-commerce shops to sell things to people. Uh, so it changed everything and it created an awful lot of new businesses as a result of that as well. Hmm, amazing. And so since then, you, you know, alhamdulillah, you, you kind of retired and you, you kind of uh, stopped doing that. But you've been doing a lot of work uh, around yeah. the kind of things that you mentioned. And, and it's kind of a lot of the stuff that the training that kind of changed your life. So you've been doing a lot mm. of work with... Uh, with children and with businesses and entrepreneurs and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about like what do you do today? I know you don't need to work, but what 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 kind of yeah, stuff that you're involved in? Yeah. How does it work? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I get approached by people all the time. I've got this great idea, you know, um, and you know I, I always try and think about my my background. So I'll I'll help people. I'll t tell people give people advice, you know, because I didn't get that from anybody. So, um, you know, if someone wrote to me, um, I'd try and help them if possible uh, by giving them advice and direction on what they should do. Or if I think it's not a good idea, I'll tell them that as well. As long as they listen, they'll, they'll maybe uh, save some money. Um, and uh, I'm on the, the board at the University of Huddersfield, which you know, I find very satisfying simply because of the fact I left school with no qualifications. It's nice mm -hmm. to be able to, to sit on a board of a, a university. It's nice to be able to sometime at graduation walk around with my cap and gown on, uh, walk through town. And it's one of the things that uh, my mother was extremely proud of because she got to see me uh, at the university. Uh, and also when my daughter graduated, who was the first person in her entire family, to actually get a degree. You know, when she got a degree, my mother was in the audience and I was on stage as well as my daughter. I was wow. sat in the crowd and, you know, when she came up to collect a degree, uh, things like that. My mother passed away this year. And it, it, I know it was one of the most, you know, um, uh, proudest moments for her was the, the fact seeing me, uh, you know, at the university. Uh, I've sat on the board of Yorkshire Ford, which was the government development agency for Yorkshire, uh, you know, a very big, uh, big thing. Uh, I'm involved with a law firm as well. Um, and I don't know anything about law, but I've, all I've done is applied retail principles and seen their business grow. I'm the chairman of a, a company called Cuba, which uh, spelled with a Q. Um, and they build very, very large websites. I own part of that. And they build very, very large websites, and that's quite satisfying as well. And I've helped lots of other companies as well. Uh, I get asked to give talks like this. This is effectively a talk. And if you go to my website, you can see one of my talks um, uh, on YouTube, and you can listen to that. Um, and I, I call my talk Cut the Crap. I'm the chief provocateur of Cut the Crap because I was fed up of listening to people talking crap when I would go to their talks. So it's nice and simple. And a lot of the things I've said here, uh, you'll hear that on uh, my talk as well. Uh, so, you know, I'm kept busy doing all sorts of things, but the difference is I can choose what to do Wonderful. rather than, you know, I have to go to an office every day. Mm. So the one of the last things I wanted to kind of focus on before we close uh, is just talking a little bit about leadership because mm. um, I think, like, leadership is so important and... Um, I want you to understand from you because now that you're helping so many different people in different areas and in different industries, um, you know, what do you see uh, leadership is all about and how do you kind of develop yourself to be a good leader? I think it comes from 
experience. It's 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 about reading things and what have you. There's an awful lot of awful leaders, isn't there? And people say to me, who was your mentor? Uh, my mentor was all the crap people that I worked with. I learned an awful lot from okay. those people about how not to do it. You know, uh, I worked with some awful managers, you know, as I was progressing up the ranks in Dixon. They're awful, terrible. Uh, and you learn a lot from that. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I'd like to uh, briefly talk about is the fact that we still unfortunately have problems in this country with um, lack of uh, black and Asian senior management or directors. Um, there's hardly any um, black or Asian uh, people on boards of companies still to this day. You know, I ask people the question, can you, uh, can you imagine how many times they get asked to sit on a board of a company? And they think, well, you must get asked loads of times. And the honest answer is, I never get asked to sit on the board of the company. The only reason I'm the chairman of Cuba in Sheffield is because I own part of it. I never, ever get asked to sit on the board of a company, even though I might be in the top 100 most powerful um, business people in Yorkshire, even though um, I'm in newspapers, in, in magazines, and I do talks. It never happens. And the last time I actually saw a black or Asian person on the board of the company was, well, I, I can't remember. What, why is that? Why do you think that's still why the case? Uh, I think uh, subconscious uh, racism uh, is still the case, or bias rather than, let's call it bias rather than racism. Um, and uh, there's no shortage of people, uh, but people get to a certain point in their, in their uh, em you know, employer's uh, company and they don't go above that. So I'm in the legal business, and Leeds is the biggest legal centre outside of London. And there's absolutely no shortage of black or Asian uh, lawyers. Uh, but in the whole of um, Leeds, uh, there's probably maybe about 20 partners. That's it. And there's not a single managing partner. Now, there is actually an awful lot of partners and managing partners. And the reason is because they've had to start their own business. That's the only way to become a partner. Hmm. It's to start their own business. And I, I imagine that the, the, the Jewish people had exactly the same issues in the 20s and 30s when they came to this country. Uh, so they had to start their own businesses. And that's why there's so many Jewish uh, law firms and accountancy firms because they have to start their own businesses. So it's it's something that we have to overcome, and it's something that we mustn't be afraid to talk of. You know, I've talked about it, I've, I've written about it, I've appeared in publications. Uh, if you go to my LinkedIn uh, profile and look at the articles, you'll see some of the things that I've written. I was hoping that um, after the last election, we might become more representative of the country that we are, and it still hasn't happened. So I think it's unconscious bias. I think that's the issue. So obviously, like you're saying, one, one way is to overcome it is to actually start your own firm. But how do we go about changing the status quo when it comes to the actual thing about like these large corporations where there's uh, super competent people like yourself, super experienced people, and most times more competent than who's in that place anyway, right? Mm. So how yeah. do we go about changing that thing about the whole institutional side of it? Yeah. Well, the, the, one of the things we've got to do is, I mean, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. Uh, it's now not about um, the guy that died in, in mm -hmm. America, George yeah. Floyd. It's not about that. It's about the, uh, the pent-up frustration of the people. That's what it's about now. People demonstrating about that. It's about that frustration. Um, so, you know, 10 years ago, we had very few women on, on the boards of companies and the government changed the law. Uh, and I don't think the government should change the law in this country um, uh, because I would hate to be sitting on the board of a company simply because they needed to tick a box. Uh, I'd want people to ask me to sit on the board because uh, they felt that I was the right person for that company. So they, the people that run these businesses need to think about that very carefully and they need to think, actually, we need to be more representative of the country that we are. Now, an example of that is uh, if you watch 
the news on the BBC, ITV or Sky, you'll notice, yeah. you know, again, you probably never noticed it, but you'll see that there's black and Asian people on there uh, because they've had to do positive discrimination. And, you know, they've done a great job. And so more big companies should do something like that, uh, but make sure they choose the right people. Um, you know, if you go to, let's say, a retail company, there's no shortage of, of black and Asian people shopping there. So why should there not be uh, more actual directors and, and, uh, and non-execs of those companies that are black and Asian? Mm, yeah, it's really, really... Yeah, I now if I actually uh, talk about it and uh, it doesn't help me get a job, then I'll be in the same position that I was before I started talking about it. So it makes no difference to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so important. Um, I think uh, we're kind of coming to the end. So I just wanted to ask your advice, really, that uh, do you have any like books that you really recommend or any hacks or tips or software or anything that you recommend yeah. that people should check out? Yeah, the, uh, one of the books that changed my uh, sort of management style was uh, one minute manager meets the monkey, mm. right? Uh, and I'll tell you what it is because it's so simple. Um, is people who have got uh, problems come to you and they try and give you their problem. So they take it off their shoulder and they give it to you. Um, and what you should do is when they try and give you their problem, you should stop them and say, whoa, and uh, ask them what it is and then um, tell them what they need to do and build in a safety bit, which is, and if that doesn't work, come back and see me. So, for instance, I, I read this book when I was in Dixon's in Manchester, and I used to stand in the middle of the shop floor, and I used to keep my hands in my pocket. So if someone came to me, came to me with a bit of paper, I'd say, what is it? I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it off them, right? What is it? Right, okay, this is what you need to do. And uh, and if it doesn't work, come back and see me. And then eventually people stopped coming to me with their problems. Uh, and they'd, they knew that I wouldn't take it off them. And they started doing it themselves. Now, most people, because now the world has changed, you know, we've got email, haven't we? Now, most people's inbox is someone else's to-do list. So if someone writes to you about the problem, you need to write back and say, right, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, most people take other people's problems. So that's an example of a, uh, a book uh, that's still very, very relevant today, and which is basically people with monkeys on their shoulder, which is a problem, try and give it to you. You just got to give it. Easy. And people say, oh, I'm really busy at the moment, really, really busy. And the reason they're busy is because um, they accept other people's problems and they do it. I don't. Mm. You know, I'll phone them up and say, listen, you sent me this email. Uh, you know, this is what you need to do. Uh, and I get very little email as a result of that from the, from the business that I work in. Mm. Amazing. Okay, so that's a good book. Anything else you recommend? Um, I would, no, I'd recommend that there's lots and lots of websites out there uh, to do with personal development. Just read them. Amazing. Read them. Uh, and if I if I see a book that uh, someone else has talked about uh, that they say is really good, uh, I don't go and buy it. I'll type into Google, you know, a summary of that book, and the chances are someone else has uh, read it and written a summary about it. Um, and it's quicker to read that summary than to go and buy that book. So I save twenty odd pounds as well. Amazing. Okay, mm. wonderful. So if people want to find out more about you, people want to check you out, like I'm going to put the link anyway, but tell us, where do they go uh, to find out more uh, about you and read more okay. about your story? Yeah. So, um, I mean, you can go on to Google and type in Ajaz Ahmed FreeServe and you'll see other things that people have written about me. Uh, but if you go to my website, which is sosavvy.co.uk, and you can put that link up on, on, on that. Uh, on there, you can uh, watch uh, Cut the Crap um, uh, talk that I've given. Uh, you can read the full free serve story um, and a little bit more about me and, and contact information. Or you can go onto LinkedIn as well and uh, see my profile, read about some of the things that I've written about. Um, so it's very easy to do that. Fantastic. Okay, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here today. I've learned so much just by speaking to you. And you know what? It's felt like an experience because you've, mm. you've kind of done something that 
you know, most people have never ever even dreamed about. Mm. So Jazakallah Khair, thank you so much for no, all thank your you time for, and advice. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a, a, I, I was looking forward to it and it's great talking to you. Wonderful. Okay. I know everyone watching would have got lots, uh, lots of benefit and you really played your part in them becoming uh, better leaders and CEOs. So, uh, brothers and sisters, this is the Muslim CEO show. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did doing it. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do that. Check out our free training at MuslimCEO.com. And uh, once again, it just thank you so much and inshallah we'll see you no. soon. Assalamu thank alaikum. you. Pleasure. Thank you. Well,